Hello students, welcome back. This is the third part of this lecture about what are models. And we just got done talking about what a numerical was, model was. Now we're going to talk about what we mean by numerical weather prediction. When you turn on the television and you see your local forecast, um, most of the time that is a combination of the meteorologist using his own experience plus numerical weather prediction, where a numerical model of the atmosphere was consulted to figure out what the atmosphere is going to do with respect to time. Numerical weather prediction then is using numerical models of the atmosphere to make forecasts of the weather, specifically weather, not necessarily climate, weather out to a few days out into the future. I mean, when you watch the television forecast, they have a really good forecast for maybe the first 24 to 48 hours. They have some good ideas about what the weather is going to do for like the next three or four days, but as time goes by, the skill of the forecast goes down. Um, Numerical weather prediction, or NWP then, is done by dividing the atmosphere up into little grid points. They are locations uh, in the atmosphere where you're going to be trying to solve the seven primitive equations. Uh, you usually make, it's called a grid point because they're usually like on a grid where you would, you know, say along this latitude line there's these points and along these longitude lines there's that one. So you've divided the atmosphere up into a grid. That is done both horizontally like on a map and vertically. So the atmosphere is sort of made up of a three-dimensional grid of locations where you're going to apply the seven primitive equations. Here's an example of the, out I have to admit I can't remember what <coughs> model, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of different numerical mo weather prediction models that are run by different entities like the National Weather Service and various universities and so on. Uh, I forget pr which particular one this was, but you can see the locations of each. And every one of the little dots on the map there, they are computing the seven primitive equations to make forecasts at those individual locations. That how close together those grid points are is called the resolution of the model. Uh, you guys understand the idea of resolution. I mean, a picture can have high resolution or low resolution or whatever. It has to do with how good it is at detecting differences between things that are close to each other. So, like, this is a pretty high resolution model. This happens to be a, a model called Ada 4. It doesn't matter all that much. But it's a computer program. It is a computer model, a, a numerical model of the atmosphere. And there's a little white dot here at every location where those model grid points are. On the other hand, the Ada 4 model, because it has a very good resolution where the grid points are very close together, well, we just could not run this model for the whole world. In fact, it may be hard to see depending on the way the video renders and so on. But basically, the Ada 4 model runs for um, you know a, a domain that basically covers the North North America. Um, you know, at, at maybe 10% of the area of the Earth or something like that. There just isn't a big enough computer to run a model like that in a reasonable amount of time. There's no value in running a numerical model to predict the weather 24 hours from now if it takes the model a week to make that simulation. Uh, you need something that'll, you know, run, it'll do this much math in, you know, maybe five or six hours so that you can still get the forecast out to the meteorologist and they can use the numerical model before, you know, 24 hour forecast is now in the past. So, Usually these high resolution models where the grid points are pretty close together have to be a regional model. In contrast, again, I don't know how well this will render on the video, but the, these little white spots here are showing you the locations of the grid points in another model. This happens to be a model called the uh, G GFS, uh, but again, that's not, I mean, the names of the models aren't what's important here. Uh, the, but the GFS is a global forecast model, it's a global forecast system, and it's run by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Again, none of that really particularly matters for what we're doing, but it is global. Everywhere on the globe there are these grid points. I only show you like the Northern Hemisphere of this map, but the whole world has them. But they are farther apart. There's just no computer, even a supercomputer isn't powerful enough to run this model when there's so many grid points. I mean, if you put the grid points half as far apart, you have four times as many grid points where you have to be computing those four primitive equations thousands and thousands of times. So, uh, you know, like if you zoom in on just North America in the GFS model, you can see, for example, in Nebraska, there's only two grid points in the whole state. The model doesn't have all that good of resolution. It can kind of tell you the difference between temperatures in the eastern half of the state and the western half of the state. That's pretty much it. It can't actually... Uh, you know, like indicate what's the difference between the weather in Omaha versus the weather in Lincoln. If it thinks it's going to rain in Omaha, I can't tell you how the weather is going to be different in Lincoln. The resolution of the forecast isn't all that great. But it is global. It's telling you something about the weather patterns worldwide. 
This is in general a trade-off that we have to ex uh, have between the size of the domain of a model and the resolution of the model. For climate purposes, we're only going to be able to use global models. We need to understand globally how the climate system is working. But for a, just a forecast of what the weather is going to be doing 48 hours from now, these regional models are often good enough. Just to give you a sense as to what the resolution is, I did some uh, reading up the other day. The current, for regional models, the state of the art now is to have the resolution to be about 12 kilometers. So the grid points in the model are about 12 kilometers apart. 12 kilometers, that's about, what, 8 miles or something like that? So, um, you know, there's multiple grid points, say, over the city of Omaha. I mean, the model can distinguish the differences between, like, what the temperatures will be like downtown versus out in the suburbs or something like that. The, the model has very high resolution. In contrast, the current global state-of-the-art numerical weather prediction models are, have a, a resolution of about 110 kilometers. Okay, so, uh, you know, they're covering the whole world, but, you know, it, it, so if something that's going on in, say, Asia is what's going to be affecting the weather in Omaha in the next couple of days, this is good. You have a global model. You can see that weather system. On the other hand, it does not have very good resolution. Um, when you want to run one of these numerical weather prediction models, like any computer program, it requires input. And the input to a numerical weather prediction model is current observations of the weather from where all over the domain. So this is part of the reason why we collect weather observations at official federal weather stations all around the world is because the input, these equations form the input to the seven primitive equations. You start at every grid point with what is the temperature, the pressure, and the winds now, and then the seven primitive equations are calculated out in the numerical weather prediction model to determine what the weather will be like in one time step, two time steps, three time steps, thousands of time steps so that you get out till tomorrow, uh, tens of thousands of time steps to get out to next week, etc. The, they've, the set of these current observations form what is known as the initial conditions or the initial values for this model. And that's going to turn out to be important in the next lecture. So we collect these observations from all over the world. We've used them. There's a whole technique as to how you get them into the model and how the model it takes those, those weather observations and assigns values to all the grid points in the model and then applies the equations. The seven primitive equations are then applied to every grid point in the model based on those initial conditions, producing forecasts one time step into the future. Time step. The length of a time step depends on the resolution of the model. The higher the resolution of the model, the shorter the time step has to be. That's a kind of a hard thing to think through. As the model's grid points get closer and closer together, the little time step, the jump between each one, you know, the model can compute, let's say, 15 seconds in the future. If you make the model resolution better, you now have to actually they'll compute, say, every six seconds into the future or something like that. So this is kind of a trap. See how these high-resolution models get more and more computationally needy? I mean, if you have your domain and you doubled the number of grid points in there, you're going to have to compute the seven primitive equations twice as many times. But, actually, you have to compute the, the seven primitive equations way more than that because now your time step is smaller. To get to some specified time in the future, like 24 hours from now, it's going to take a whole lot more time steps because the time steps get smaller the closer and closer the grid points get together. This is sort of a trap. As much as it would seem like we want to make these grid points closer and closer and closer together, the problem is that we have to do more and more in math. It grows fast, the computational needs. You not only have more grid points, but the time step is smaller. To get to some point in the future takes even more and more time steps. This is why we just can't have these numerical weather predictions models have amazing resolution. I mean, it seems the equations would work. If we wanted to make a numerical weather prediction model that could forecast with a resolution of, say, 100 meters, and it could literally tell the difference between the weather, you know, on this block versus that block versus one, the, the equations would work just fine. The problem is we don't have computers big enough to run something like that. Even now, the numerical weather prediction models that are actually run uh, you know, by the National Weather Service and the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts and the Japanese Meteorological Agency and all the other key forecast agencies around the world that make weather forecasts, they typically run on supercomputers so that they can actually get the, all these calculations done in a matter of hours. 
and that way you are able to get a forecast, you know, in time to actually distribute it out to your forecasters and so on. In contrast, like for example, in the past when we've actually had models running at Creighton, you know, if it took two days for it to make a one-day forecast, well, it was really just for educational purposes. I mean, if it took a computer that we had here at Creighton two days to calculate a 24-hour forecast, yes, okay, the pat it's already... We're past that point already. That forecast has no use, but it was just a teaching tool. It didn't really matter. The models then create, ca calculate forward and compute the um, temperature, the pressure, the winds, and the humidity, and so on at every grid point at some location in the future. Other programs then actually compute, make you know visualizations of what's going on here. All right. In this course, we're not going to get all bogged down in like how to read maps and things like this here. But what you what the forecaster actually gets are maps and visualizations that show how weather patterns are moving and how temperatures are changing and how winds in the jet stream are shifting and so on. And they typically are pretty valid out to about maybe three or four days, maybe even out to like five or six days. Sometimes the forecast models get pretty good, but after a while. Farther into the future than that, there's not really a lot of purpose in running numerical weather prediction models. Their predictions of the weather just aren't all that good, which is going to make you start wondering how we're going to make climate forecasts about like what's going to happen 100 years from now if we double carbon dioxide. We'll get to that. Numerical weather prediction is important. It is how we safely conduct our airline system. It helps us know whether or not to open schools. It helps us know how to uh, make predictions about irrigating crops and so on. It is when you turn on the television, it's what the weatherman is telling you. Um, we're going to be then finding out how that's connected to climate in the next lecture, in the next video. Uh, but for now, let's answer a couple questions about what you just saw. Question seven. In numerical weather prediction, there is a trade-off between the size of a model's domain and the blank of the model due to limitations in computer power. Is the limitation due to, uh, do we have to make a trade-off with resolution, accuracy, precision, or reliability of the model? It's an interesting question. Choose from one of your four options below to get some feedback before we move on to question eight.